What's up, everybody? Welcome to the Pick 6 Podcast, CBS Sports Daily NFL Podcast. I'm Will Brinson. I'm your host. We're continuing to run through the divisions with training camp burning questions, and we are going to talk about the AFC East, which means burning questions for the Pats, Dolphins, Jets, and Bills. You can check out in the feed the AFC North featuring not me. That's right. Took a vac- I, didn't, I didn't really take a vacation. I was just, I was, in fact, was rushing back for a podcast and was told, you don't have to come back, dumb dumb. We told you that before you left. AFC North is being handled by Ryan Wilson and John Breach. Of course, the rest of the divisions will be in the feed coming up. And we would remind you, too. If you're being delayed a year, the Tokyo Olympics are finally here in a brand new Attacking Third podcast is your audio home for the most comprehensive U.S. women's national team soccer coverage. Host Sandra Herrera and Lisa Roman will provide previews and immediate recaps bright and early as soon as U.S. WNT matches wrap up in the morning. Download and follow Attacking Third wherever you listen to this podcast. Joining me to break down the AFC East, a man who's carved out a niche in Boston. Right? I feel like you got the AFC on lockdown. Tyler Sullivan, good friend of the pod. Sully, what's up, buddy? What's going on? Well, yeah, I guess so. Sure. Why not? I mean, you know, I, I, sure. I carved myself a way in. doesn't matter. It's a good niche. It's, yeah, I think so. Not bad. I mean, you'd like for, you'd like for the niche, like you would have liked to have started in 2001, but you know. Yeah, that would be cool. But, you know, I was in like third grade, so that'd be a, that'd be pretty <laughs> impressive. That'd be pretty impressive. Yeah. The internet didn't really exist. In two, I mean, it did, obviously, in 2001, but it was very, um, like, Anyway, we're not going to, I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to derail myself by talking about the internet in 2001. (laughs) Instead, let's get to the obvious question for the first team that we will talk about those very Patriots. And the question of course is who will be the starting quarterback in week one, Cam Newton or Mac Jones? Yeah, this is good. This is the story that you're going to be following in Foxborough when, when camp opens up. I mean, I don't know if there is really anything Mac Jones can do. I think if, if we're being honest, it's Cam Newton's job to lose right now, even though there's a first round quarterback sitting there waiting in the wings in Mac Jones. I just have a hard time with everything that Bill Belichick has done to this point, backing Cam Newton. I can't almost I, I can't allow myself to think that even if he's having a subpar camp that he'll replace him. There's just too much stock being put in Cam Newton by Bill Belichick for him not to be the week one starter. That said, I do think that it's something to watch here because if Mac Jones is neck and neck with Cam Newton or at least shows some flashes over the course of the preseason, I think that that's more of an indication that you'll see him at some point during the regular season, not necessarily week one. I mean, uh, I think uh, this will. Patriots fans will probably push back on this, but you have to think through the logical, the whole logical concept of it. If Mac Jones doesn't play in 2021, that's good news. It means Cam Newton has been good enough for the Patriots to make a playoff run and to get the Patriots in playoff contention, AFC East contention, whatever it is. If Cam Newton plays that well, I think that's a win for Patriots fans and the Patriots as a whole. But I would be pretty shocked at this point if we didn't see some Mac Jones. I, I guess in theory there is a alternate reality where Mac Jones is so terrible that he can't replace Cam. Like Cam's right. bad and Mac has looked bad or Mac's hurt or something like well, that. Well, it's like a Stidham 2.0 type of thing that you saw last year. Like, okay, Stidham can't supplant Cam Newton here. Well, does that mean he's he's terrible? Like, what what's the case here? And so – yeah, yeah, that's certainly an avenue there. But yeah, I, I agree with you. Like if if the Patriot if Cam Newton's playing six or seventeen games now, that's a good thing. That means that you're actually succeeding and he has been able to bounce back. But as we talk about like a training camp situation, I think this is more of a will Mac Jones be able to threaten to start at some point how, in the year? How how small can he make the gap? Right. Right. And exactly. I, I agree with you completely, by the way, because I think that regardless of I, I look at it very similar to Jimmy Garoppolo and Trey Lance for the 49ers in, in an ironic fashion because Garoppolo is supposed to be the guy who's the next Patriots quarterback. And then, of course, everybody thought the 49ers were going to take Mac Jones at three. So, like, some weird crossover yeah, there. There's, there's a lot of cross-pollination yeah, between the 49ers and the Patriots. Yeah, it's very, very odd. Uh, but my point being is that I don't – I mean, people are like, oh, what if Trey Lance beats out Jimmy Garoppolo? Well, I, I don't think – the 49ers are going to approach it that way. And I don't think the Patriots are going to approach it that way. I think they want to give the veteran, the, they're going to give the veteran the job. And then if Cam Newton and Jimmy Garoppolo manage to play well and the team wins games, they're going to you know just roll with that for as long as they possibly can. 
at which point they're not healthy, they're ineffective, or they're losing football games because of poor quarterback play, they're going to yank him out and toss in the rookie and see what they got. And um, it's not that they don't trust these rookies to be ready. It's just if you have that veteran, give the rookie more time. I think that's the mindset for for both teams and, and certainly for Bill Belichick in particular. Right, and when, you, when you're talking about Belichick, specifically with Newton, I mean, like I was saying earlier, there's a lot of stock being put in by Bill Belichick to go into Cam Newton's corner. I mean, you know, I don't think anybody last year would have, you know, batting an eye if, if he put Stidham in and, and didn't, didn't re-sign Newton and all that. But Belichick, time and time again, has kind of stood by Newton at every point where we all kind of look at it and say, well, dude, you can do whatever you want here. It's not like this is Tom Brady or anything yeah, along no those one, lines. In fact, no one will care if you bench Cam Newton. It'll, exactly. It'll in the streets of Boston. And so, and so that's why I look at it and say, okay, even if Mac Jones is the better quarterback in camp, if it's by the slimmest of margins – He's going to go with the veteran. He's going to start with Cam Newton and then eventually go with Mac Jones. And this isn't really even to say, like, because I know the narrative's out there, like, oh, you can't have Mac Jones out there in week four against Brady. You know, you could ruin the quarterback. If he's ready, he's ready. Like, I, I don't really buy into trying to pick the matchups too, too much. I mean, if you want to start to kind of pick through the schedule to see when things can work out, like a bye week or an extended rest, I could kind of understand you there. But I don't think that it has anything to do with like trying to avoid Brady or anything like that. If Mac Jones is ready and they want to start this thing early, by all means, go for it. But from everything that we've seen from Belichick to this point, I lean towards him going with Newton and the veteran. If the problem is, I mean, and this is, look, we ripped the Bears for it. So give them, I guess, a little bit of credit for taking the same approach. In this, you know, I, I don't, I'm trying not to be a hypocrite here and, and pop up the Patriots and the 49ers plans while ripping the Bears. I just think the Bears is self serving and the Patriots and 49ers have a logic to it. But the goal is it's hard to go back to the veteran. You don't yeah. want to get, you want to draft a rookie in the first round and say, all right, you sucked for three games to start the season. We're going with Andy Dalton slash Cam Newton slash Jimmy Garoppolo. That defeats the purpose of drafting the guy in the first round. To begin with, he needs the experience. So if you're going to throw him out there, you need to be willing to commit to it. Right. So I guess I'm crediting the Bears or something like that. I don't know. But yeah, I think that's, to me, it's not a hard thing to figure out when you look at this team, the Patriots. They're going to start Cam Newton. If they're winning football games, Cam's going to play. And they'll let Mac learn. And if they're losing football games, Mac comes in. And I really just wonder too, like how many, how much reps are we really going to see Mac Jones get? He, you know, throughout minicamp, he was the number two guy, you know, behind uh, Cam Newton. But there was still Brian Hoyer's on the roster, Jared Stidham's on the roster. You know, that's four quarterbacks to really divvy up some work here. And is Mac Jones going to be going to school still, as opposed to being getting ready and practicing with the team? Is he still going to be learning with with Brian Hoyer and Josh McDaniels and being taken off to the side to learn all these things to get ready to play at some point, but not necessarily week one? Again, the whole thing about Cam Newton was, well, he didn't have a proper offseason. There was COVID. He signed late in the summer. Now he has all of that at, at his disposal. And I think Belichick wants to prove himself right here to say, listen, this is a guy I, I identified to sign last year. It didn't work out. But now that we actually have all of these available things in front of him, training camp, preseason, and all of that, this is what I was planning on in 2020. Yep. I, I think it's spot on. And Cam got an unfair shake. You know, I mean, that's yeah. a that's a, a weird, weird spot to be in. The Buffalo Bills. It's hard to nitpick anything on Buffalo. Yeah. I think Buffalo, this is a Buffalo's fine top. one. It's can the running game improve? And so really it just surrounds Devin Singletary and Zach Moss. Again, not something that we're going to kind of really hammer out and know definitively at the end of training camp. But that unit is one that probably should take central focus. I mean, you know, we have a written piece on this on CBSSports.com. There's a few other things to look at as well for the team. But for me, they were dangerously close to being one-dimensional. I don't think anybody was afraid of their, you know, their running game last year. Singletary was their leading rusher with a little over 600 yards. Obviously, Josh Allen's legs come into play. He was their leading touchdown scorer on the ground with eight. You know, there, there's that dynamic to it. But... Was Zach Moss, was Devin Singletary really doing anything to instill fear and make opposing defenses worry about them? And so as much as we're praising Josh Allen and, and putting him in MVP conversations and, and loving the leap that he took last year, you know, it's, it, that was a great year for him. I mean, he went up just exponentially from what we saw over his first two years. You know, if there's going to be a step back, he's going to need some help in the backfield to ease, the, ease those struggles. You know, it's not a guarantee that he's just going to come out and go – go be a world beater right right again so to me 
if you can solidify that running game, I think it helps you multiple ways, not only with Allen, but if you're going up against the Kansas City Chiefs, you're not then asking Josh Allen to go throw for throw at Patrick Mahomes. You can actually lean on a running game to keep Mahomes off the field. Yeah, I mean, it's you You want to be able to close out games. Yeah. You need your, running, your rushing attack to close out games. You don't need to have a team that comes out and runs the ball 50 times to start the, you know, to start things off and, and, but you need to be able to close things out. And that's one thing that I guess you could say the bills don't do well, although they were so explosive in the past. And one of the, here's the other thing too, Sully, the bills defense wasn't that great through the first half of the year last year. I think we can probably uh, attribute some of that to, to COVID and maybe a, just a weird season because they got better as the season went along, um, you know, because this is a defense that we've seen be fairly consistent over the last couple of years. And and so I, I think there's a chance that maybe the running game improves if the defense comes – like regresses to normal. It, yeah. it regresses in this case as a positive. Right. Um, so I, I think there's a chance that the defense will be better, the Bills will be less inclined to throw – more inclined to run, and because you're running late when you've got a lead, you're going to be more effective. You're going to run to win, and maybe Zach Moss and Devin Singletary are a little more comfortable in the offense and, and can play better football. Right, and this is a team that's invested heavily in the running back position. I mean, Zach Moss, what was he, a second-round pick uh, in 2020? I mean, Singletary, another high pick. Like they, they are investing to have a solid running game, and – 600 rushing yards. I don't know what Moss had. I think it was around like 400 or something like that. Like that's, you know, yes, you're combining for a thousand yard rusher, but you kind of need to have that dynamic attack there. And I don't know if Singletary is, you know, I don't know if he's the guy to be that. Maybe Moss is the one that takes the leap and, and becomes that legit clear cut guy in the backfield. But to me, take away some of the abuse that Josh Allen can take running the football, being able to close out games. I, I think that this is one of those things that they need to focus on overall for through training camp. And obviously as you go on through the year, I would agree with you completely. We'll see uh Buffalo's not, Buffalo's not very exciting to talk about in like a training camp perspective. No. Cause I mean, you know, just the, other, the other, the other they're, they're, they've just retained a lot of guys. You know, the other questions that I had were, you know, is, is Zach Ertz available? Could you add to that offense? What's the number two cornerback situation going to look like? Those are some position, you know, positional things, questions and, and position battles that you can consider. But to me, the running game was something that would have been their Achilles heel a little bit last year, obviously defense as well. But like that was one area where, you know, they were a prolific offense. But it was really just through the passing game. There was not really much running game to speak of. If they can fix that, this is a very well-rounded offense. Yeah, agreed completely. All right, let's take a break. When we come back, the Dolphins have one very obvious pressing question, and we will tell you what it is. The key thing about the Dolphins in 2021, I mean, because you look at this roster for Miami, and they are loaded on – really both sides uh, of the ball. I mean, they have a, well, maybe running back is kind of a problem. Miles Gaskins are featured back, but they got to, they've added to the offensive line. Actually, I'm going to take it back. They're not loaded, but there's a lot of intriguing pieces on both sides of the ball. A defense that has played well, uh, an offense that has certain a lot of flashes. They add Jalen Waddle, Mike Gusecki's there. But the one thing that we just don't know about is Tua Tungavailoa. And the question is, the burning question for them, is Tua Tungavailoa truly a franchise quarterback? Right. Well, and one of these things, kind of like what you were just saying, that is a good roster, but it's a roster that could be great if a good quarterback, a franchise quarterback is there to elevate them. We don't know if the Miami Dolphins have that. And it's kind of crazy to say, I even wrote this in the piece, like it's weird to say that a guy entering his second season who was, you know, considered to be one of the great young quarterbacks not too long ago, a number five overall pick is in like a make or break year. But that's what it kind of feels like. With Tua, it, it does feel like if things don't turn out well in 2021, the Dolphins are going to be looking at themselves and saying, okay, we got to figure this thing out, whether it's going back into the draft. Does you know it, does Deshaun Watson have his off-the-field stuff cleared up? Do we go pursue that? You know, Is another quarterback shaken loose? Do we go after Aaron Rodgers if he's in Green Bay in 2021 and then he's available in 2022? Like Those are the questions they're going to have to ask themselves. If Tua doesn't pan out in 2021, which is kind of crazy, you know, because again, it's still so early in the kid's career. And in, but to me, 
this was an offseason where they were very clearly positioned to get one of those top quarterbacks when they had the number three overall pick. And not only did they trade out of that pick, but they doubled down by not taking quarterback. They took his to his college teammate in Jalen Waddle to give him even more weapons along with going after Will Fuller. While surrendering another first round pick to move up to the Eagles, by the way. Right. So, so like, I mean, all of a sudden your haul for that three pick isn't quite as good as you thought it could have been, you know, you just you you are showing and again this is I guess the right thing to do again you know you you drafted a guy not too long ago number five overall you you have to at least see it through to some degree and so they're doing the right things here by getting Jalen Waddle and and trying to stretch the stretch the field by getting some deep threats like Will Fuller something that you know they really were un, unable to do last year and so it's just a matter of can Tua now with the pieces that they put in front of him or around him. Can he perform to, to just a degree where you could say, okay, there is some hope here. There is some potential. There are some flashes. He, he doesn't have to, you know, take this Josh Allen type leap, you know, as he took from year two going into year three, him going from year one to year two, but it needs to at least show some signs of improvement. I mean, you know, we saw earlier this off season, whatever it was, I think it was mini camp. Didn't he throw like five interceptions in camp and, you know, that, I kind of give with a grain of salt because all these practices, these quarterbacks are trying to do something. You know, they're experimenting. They're, they're doing and, and then they came out and said afterwards, they were like, you know, it's not quite. Uh, you know, we weren't exactly. You know, we were trying to we were trying to make deep ball passes. We were right. trying to run the two minute drill. We were trying all this different stuff, and that may have led to two or throwing those interceptions. Right. That's where you make those mistakes. You know, Jimmy Garoppolo when he was in New, New England, notorious for not being a great practice player, but then when he got into the field, he he was great. So you know, you're just trying different things. You're testing it out. So I don't give it too much credence, but at the same time, like I don't know if that bleeds into some games here, and he, he really is that kind of a quarterback, then. The Dolphins have some real questions on their hands, and, and it's it's almost it, it's it's a shame too because Brian Flores is such a great coach. They're building such a a wonderful team down there in Miami, very like Washington esque. But if all of a sudden they don't have the quarterback, I mean, really, what are you doing? You know, it's interesting too the because they yanked they pulled Fitzpatrick out. Uh, did he get hurt or did he? Was I'm trying to remember the Jets game? So they oh that's right they had their bye. And they bring the, the announcer going to go with Tua. And everybody's like, what, what are you doing? You've been winning a bunch of games. It looks like you're going to be a playoff contender. Why are you going to Tua now? Why didn't you go to him earlier? What is the deal with this plan? He comes in, he plays against uh, the Rams, and they beat the Rams 28-17. Tua doesn't look that good. Now, that's against a good defense. But then the next week, Arizona, they went 34-31. I thought Tua, that was Tua's, had to have been his best game of the year. He looked awesome. He, he was flashing. And he was going against Kyler Murray, you know, former number one overall pick, a guy who had gotten MVP hype coming to the year, and he beat him, and he and he played as well as Kyler Murray did. And then the next week, uh, they take out the Chargers, and he he looks okay. There's you know no interceptions in those two games, you know, run, ran the ball. Uh, I guess he didn't run against the Chargers, but he ran the ball well against against the uh, uh, the Cardinals, and then against Denver. He gets yanked out for Ryan Fitzpatrick, and he's inactive the rest of the season. So it was a bunch of yo-yoing uh, with. You know, with Tua and Ryan Fitzpatrick, and that's where you come to the question part of it is: is can Brian Flores be consistent and be and be you know take the right approach here? Well, this is what we were saying earlier in the podcast, talking about quarterbacks. Once you go to that young guy, it doesn't really make a lot of sense to go back. And, and I understand that it did help them win a, a couple of games or a game or two, and it, it kept them competitive. And you know, you know, whatever, it helped them that week to possibly win that game or give them the best possible shot to win that game. But I almost wonder if that was a, you know, temporary high, long-term, not really, you know, great for the franchise. Because at the end of the day, you want Tua to practice going on two-minute drills, game-winning drives. And even if he doesn't come out on top, you'd rather him go through those lumps earlier in his career than have never faced them before. And when you're actually become, he's actually your franchise quarterback and you're actually trying to contend and you get into a situation like that, he has zero experience. Like you would want those things to actually happen. So for me, I didn't really love, you know, it was kind of, it was funny. It was funny on social media to have the Fitz magic, you know, go on and all that. It, you know, it, it's a fun storyline for us, but for the development of Tua, I don't think that that was really the best move for them last year. I, I, I would agree with that as well. It, it felt like they did a lot of things right in terms of winning football games, but not like, not um, development. You know, it's not a developing development. Tua. Yeah. 
Like if yeah. the goal is long term to be good and Tua to be good and to find out what you have in Tua, it didn't feel like 2020 was the best way to handle that. All right, finally, of course, quarterbacks. It, it, you know, yeah. you feel cheap, you feel dirty going to quarterbacks and everyone on, on almost all of these. But th- that's what the AFC East is about. It's Josh Allen. The Bills are really good, and then. What did the other three teams have? And the clear burning question for the Jets is, is Zach Wilson ready to go for week one? Yeah, I mean, listen, you know, like you said, Josh Allen, MVP candidate. The other three teams used first round picks over the last two years at the quarterback position, and they're still trying to figure out what they're doing there. And key among them, the New York Jets, number two overall pick, Zach Wilson. He's going to probably start. Like, I know, I think Robert Sala was kind of vague about, like, whether or not he's going to be the week one starter. When you have a team like that, and you draft a quarterback that high, you know, nowadays they start week one. They just they trade st- Sam Darnold without get you know, like you're not swapping out any yeah. picks or anything. You're just trading Sam Darnold. This is not a Cam Newton to Mac Jones, Jimmy Garoppolo to Trey Lance. You you are just, you are bringing the young guy in. You're, you're, it's almost like Joe Burrow. It, that That is the more similar situation. He's just going to be your week one starter. The question is, is he ready to do it? I mean, you know, he's going to be the week one starter. I, I would put money down on it, but is he actually ready to fill that in? And this is a really interesting thing with the New York Jets. It's not like he's coming into a system that has a Bill Belichick and Josh McDaniel. Robert Sala, first-time head coach. Uh, LaFleur, first-time offensive coordinator. There's a lot of newness going on in New York where, you know, a lot of people are just trying to figure it out on the fly, you know, how, how they're going to run this thing. And so for me, that's a lot for a young quarterback here. The Jets kind of got to be careful because you don't want to break them too early and then you're all doing a Sam Darnold 2.0. So for me, it's Bring him along slowly. Let's see how he does, but let's not ask too much of him right out of the gate. Well, and that's in theory what that offense should do. Yeah. Is say, all right, look, this guy's mobile. He's got a big arm. We want to limit the number of throws. You don't want Joe Burrow 2020. And I don't mean that like Joe Burrow's skill set because Joe Burrow's awesome. What you don't want is to put so much on his plate that he's having to be the entire offense. You need to let the pieces around him kind of elevate him a little bit in a way that didn't happen with Sam Darnold. That just, it's it's like the old Seinfeld episode, right? The opposite. Dude, just do the opposite of what just you do, do with the Sam opposite. Darnold. Just do the opposite. If Sam Darnold's chicken salad on, probably <laughs> references too much, but you know, like, I, I know do the opposite. Just do the opposite of what you do with Sam Darnold. And I think they're trying to do that. And I don't think it matters if Zach Wilson is ready for week one because he's going to be in there week one. Right. Ready or not, he's he's going to be in there week one. And in, like you're saying, to their credit, it does feel like the Jets are learning from the previous mistakes of the the, the, the guys that previously held their jobs, whether it's the GM, the head coach. The, the Jets do have an offensive line that they can put around Wilson that is much better than what Darnold had in years prior. And the defense should be good enough, or at least the front seven should be good enough to limit opposing offenses so Wilson doesn't have to just sling it for an entire game. I mean, you know, they do have pieces in place there to keep opposing offenses somewhat at bay. Who who knows how much that'll actually come to fruition, but Salah, defensive-minded head coach, that should be a very that should be a strength of New York and also when they when they're, you know, developing a young quarterback again, not asking too much of them. I know you bring up Burrow, but I I honestly look towards Tua as well, you know, there was just a little bit of misdirection in the development of how they were bringing Tua along in Miami last year, as we were just illustrating. You don't want that in New York because I just don't know if they're an organization equipped to fix that mistake. Like I think Miami might be able to do this year. If they break him early, I don't know if they'll be able to, whether it's you know patience wise or, or whatever in that city, be able to fix Wilson if he's broken in year one. You got to leave him in there, let him take his lumps, minimize the amount that he's got to put on his shoulders and try to win some games. And the, you win, be competitive, kid looks good, and you're having a great season. If he stays healthy, looks sharp, win a couple games, you feel like he had a good season. All right, Sully, great stuff as always, my man. Uh, we will have many more training camp burning questions coming up. In the meantime, follow, follow him at, at Tyler Sully on Twitter. Talk to you soon, buddy.